Before we get into the video, I wanted to share with you a tool that David and I have been using in our businesses to bring more profits. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to sell on Amazon. If you're selling on Amazon, you have to have a competitive edge. We use a tool called Ava.Guru. Uh, it has dashboard reporting, inventory management, replenishment forecasting, profitability reports, reimbursements, and my favorite tool, dynamic pricing. It adjusts prices, it increases profitability. David and I have used this tool to, to save thousands of dollars to the bottom line. There's a special 50% off your first month, Coupon code firing the man 50. Go on over to eva.guru and enter in firing the man 50 to get 50% off your first month. Bring that money in. Profits, profits, baby. All right, on to the video. Welcome, everyone, to the Firing the Man podcast. On today's episode, we are joined by Adam Feinberg, an e commerce entrepreneur and the most popular guest of the Firing the Man podcast in the last three years. For those of you who are not familiar with Adam, we encourage you to tune into episode 91, where Adam tells his story of growing and scaling a brand leading to an incredible exit. Welcome back to the show, Adam. Uh, thanks, and I'm uh, glad to be back again. It's definitely a different world than it was when we chatted, I think, in like summerish 2021. It's like yeah. a totally different e-commerce market. It, it's, it's, the economy is much different. It, it certainly is, and we're looking forward to digging into that. So for those of our listeners who are not familiar with you, can you give some background on your path to becoming an e-commerce entrepreneur? Sure. I had a pretty unlikely path. I worked at um, a company called Accenture doing IT consulting for about four years, and my wife was a physician. She always wanted to have her own office. That was a dream of hers. So she opened her own office. She needed help. So I became like the everything go-to manager person from like marketing to like running the office. And one of the main things that I did was it was very competitive. There's too many doctors in the DC metro area. So actually getting patients into her office was a big deal. So I got involved in like making websites and Google ads and search engine optimization and stuff like that, like way back in 2009. And I became pretty good at search engine optimization and mostly stuff I picked up like in forums and stuff like that because we couldn't pay anybody. It was like we went to agencies they want two, three thousand dollars a month and we were barely scraping by to have this office. So I started picking up like clients on the side, like who wanted to like help with their websites and wanted to show up in Google. And I kept doing like my IT job. And then I was struggling between my kids who at the time were like in kindergarten-ish and like out, like early elementary school and helping with this office and doing this demanding consultant job. And I started to take off my client and my client like knew that I was like not putting in all the effort that I was before and it became kind of an ugly situation and it kind of like forced me out so um, I have a pretty cool dad and he's a pretty successful entrepreneur so I went to him and I said um, I have this cool idea to start a search engine optimization company can you help me out for like a year and like pay my salary so he put my salary on, my, on his business and like the proudest moment was about nine months later I was able to tell him that like he could stop like paying me and I had ranked a website in Google I'm using some pretty aggressive like black hat type methods like really at the top of Google for all these terms like SEO company SEO services stuff like that and we ended up like building the business up to like two three hundred clients at one point I met my partner because one of my clients in the UK named Richard Bell wanted to like expand it into the UK and like at the height of it like maybe like 2012 ish we were doing like about three four million dollars in, in, in revenue and the margins on it weren't that great because Google kept changing things. We kept having to like put money in to like fix things. And like we'd lose clients when they made an update. And I started doing affiliate marketing as a result. And then Richard came up to me and he said one of his really good friends was selling on Amazon in like 2012, 13. And he was doing so well that he was going to close his, his uh, chiropractic practice and do this full time. He's selling swim goggles and, and swim caps. And he was making like $30,000, $40,000 like a month profit. I was like, that's phenomenal. Let's go try this. So we started selling on Amazon in like 2014 ish very small like we ordered like a thousand units of our first SKUs. we didn't even try selling them in the u.s because like i didn't think we had enough money to like go into that market seriously so we started selling in the uk which is where his friend was making the majority of his money and we launched a nail lamp and we were trying to sell like 10 12 units a day and make ten dollars profit on each one it's a lot easier to make like more profit on an item with like ad cost being way less back then we did a couple of those and our plan was just like if we could do a hundred dollars a day per SKU and we had like 20 of them then like we're each making like 350,000 bucks a year like we're golden that's fantastic I never had dreams of like making like millions of dollars or anything like that I just like wanted to like like be able to t 
help my wife out, be like a stay at home dad, be the one to take my kids and stuff and do that. And then like the third or fourth product we launched was a vacuum storage bag, which, which we ended up branding and getting the trademark for by Super Luck called Space Saver. That became at the height of COVID, maybe like a $30 million brand. And I mean, to give an idea of how small it was at first, we started with a thousand units. They said like we were going to have to pay like a one-time fee for a poly bag print if like we wanted to get fancy packaging. So we're like, nah, we'll just do a generic bag in like a cardboard insert. Huh. So it was like a really crappy product and the product giveaways were allowed then. And first we started selling in the UK and, and we were like the third best seller. We were making like $200, $300 profit a day. And so let's try selling this in the US because we started to like be making some decent money out of this. And we did a product giveaway on, on this network called like AMZ Review Trader. We got a thousand reviews like in one week and we became like the number one seller like immediately in like eight days on Amazon. And all of a sudden we had like a listing that was selling like 130, 150 units a day. And we were making like 10 bucks a unit. And like that's what when we became addicted to Amazon, I said like, I'm not taking any more SEO clients anymore. We're just going to like take every dollar that we have out of the SEO business in Amazon and grow it into Amazon. And we grew the business like the second year, I think we did like the first, the first year was just like learning, but the first and then the second year really low what we were doing i think we did like over 10 million dollars sales and then over a couple of years we grew it before covid to like 40 million with like six million dollars profit and, and we had our own warehouse we had some issues with our with some 3pls like in 2017 18 ish where they didn't deliver what they were supposed to do and we got really nervous so we started doing our own warehousing so we had basically like almost a year of inventory in our warehouse in COVID hit and the competition was really low. We were able to like barely run ads, increase our prices, maybe like 25%. And like our EBITDA went to like $18 million when we sold the business. I didn't really want to sell it. I really liked what I was doing. I really, I, we had like 20 something people working for us. I liked everyone. You know, I was in my late forties. I didn't want to be retired, but it just like seemed too good. And I kind of pictured the situation going back to like 2019, like after COVID ended and it actually is like at first sellers, it's actually ended up way worse. The market's way harder. I, I think like the market volume is still much higher than 2019, but like all the things that have happened with Amazon and logistics and competition has just become a lot more challenging, which is like a lot of the reason why a lot of the aggregators have just like gotten totally chewed up. They like expected like the business to continue to grow. They weren't the only people to like make this decision, which is a mistake. I mean, all these big, you know, tech companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon were laying off people. They all kind of did like the same thing so like what's going on for trends in, in amazon like i think these are all obvious but i'll just bring them up like first of all amazon's second biggest area of growth be besides like their 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 and hosting businesses ads and the way they've grown a lot of ads is they basically made a lot more of the landscape as when i started selling on amazon they had just sponsored products which i don't even think they called it then because that was the only type of ad now they have sponsored brands and display and and they have like all these areas that are on the page that are sneaky where it's like highly rated brands but they're really ads and stuff like that and video ads and so like we went from like in 2019 probably like 25 percent of our sales were by ads and we were a huge ads vendor at the time and now like i have two new amazon stores and probably like 50 55 percent of our sales are by ads and then before the other really big sneaky is i mean amazon says this is related to demand but i'm sure it's not really and they've influenced this like like acos or roas or whatever you want to call it all of a sudden in about may of 2021 just got way way worse all of a sudden like in one month so like i had a store like our store web deals direct the one that i sold that was doing like 80 90 million dollars in sales or a cost like in one month went for the whole store went from like 20 to 27 or 28 and then like probably trended like into the 30s and now basically the model of amazon from like the way i see it and i have two new stores which i'll talk about is basically like you're going to sell a product on amazon basically with ads hoping that you could break even if you can break even after returns that's basically good so that you could develop organic traffic and hopefully you can build your organic traffic up to like the same amount of sales as like your ad traffic over time because amazon rewards you for running the ads so like you'll like a typical product will have like a margin let's say gross margin like 35 percent a five percent return rate and if you're good with ads you can get to like a 38 cost and with the return rate that basically gets you to like about break even and then so margins like web deals direct had margins that were like before payroll in the warehouse probably like in the 30s and now like the 
the new stores we have and they're they're pretty big we have this store called clear space i started with my friend duncan it's doing like it did 25 million last year this year we'll probably do like 35 40 million our margins are probably like 12 13 percent because basically like 55 percent of the sales are ads and you factor in the return rate and you have an a cost of 30 and that's basically like where you get to and if we start like raising the price like any more or lowering the ads some we're gonna end up making less based on like on all the testing we did. So that's like the type of business we had. I have some, I sit on the board of a, another Amazon store, very similar to WebDeals Direct. I had some friends that in the SEO space, I convinced to start an Amazon store like six months after I did, and they still own half of it. They sold the other half to private equity. And they're like, I can't give you specific numbers. I don't wanna say their name, but they're basically like $120 million seller. And they're like, our sales are still the same as like during COVID, but our margins have gone down like six, seven points. Points. And they have like products that have like 50, 100,000 reviews on them, like not new starter stuff because they've been selling for a really long time. That's just kind of like the trend in the marketplace. So you can ask me like questions about like my new business and launching and stuff. I'll be glad to answer any of them. I'd like to dive into this PPC dilemma that, that you're talking about. And we're feeling the same thing in our business where we look at PPC spend and ask ourselves, gosh, if we were to put those dollars elsewhere, you know, what could we do? Maybe into building an email list. There's hiring a huge team. Who knows? There's there's a lot of places we could put those dollars. But one thing I like about talking to entrepreneurs is you're presented with a problem and generally they'll find a solution. And so I'm curious with the compressed margins, with the PPC going up, how are you responding to that? Okay, what are some well, things you're doing? Okay. First of all, I just want to say that I'm managing my own PPC. I used to manage it for both stores. We rolled out clear space to like about 60, 70 ASINs. I got it pretty stable at the ACAS I want and then Duncan took it over. So I'm doing it like hands on. I'm not like working with a third party. I've tried three or four different third parties, like ones that are really big that the aggregators still use, like the Razio and stuff. And uh, I like doing it myself. I feel I can do a better job. But here's some su suggestions. One, we started doing um, day parting and offline. I can give, can email you some like day parting options. Like we noticed that ads like before eight o'clock in the morning or like after like 11 o'clock Eastern at night, like perform particularly bad and basically like wait, like the a cost between 11 o'clock at night to like eight o'clock in the morning is probably like 50%. And then your A cost the rest of the time is like 30%. So we basically turn off ads like for like 12 hours a day. Other things that we've tried doing that have worked for some of our products is if you stop running ads like on your stuff, it seems like you'll like you'll lose like organic traffic, like Amazon's rewarding you for it. So we started for some of our products like only running ads sometimes, like running ads, like we figured out like what days do the best on ads because we noticed like Sunday, for example, people are better share shopping and our ACOS was better on Sunday than like a different day. And like we like we would accept some days for portion of operations like not running out the ads at all and only running them on like Thursday, Sunday, and Monday. And and that's been effective on like keeping our organic traffic from falling off, but then like keeping our costs down. I can I can I'll send you a list of stuff like after the call, but we also started doing like more offsite Amazon stuff. So like are you familiar with like are you familiar with like Amazon attribution bonus? Like where you okay Amazon Amazon has a program called Amazon Attribution attribution where if you get traffic off of Amazon from like a Google advertisement, you can generate like a special URL and then track like the conversion rates on Amazon. And starting like in October, they will give you a 10% bonus for your set for your sale. So if you have a hundred dollar item and you generated an, an ad like off of Amazon and you get a sale, you get 10 bucks. So it covers like some of your ad costs. So we started doing like more off Amazon advertising, like in Google, we joined some more affiliate networks, reviews sites, influencers, other stuff to like generate traffic. There's lots of different sites where you can, it's like kind of like a share or sell concept where you give like three get what you pay like 15 to 20 percent like a commission like per sale some of them will allow you to use your attribution link so you can get like some of your money back and i would say like 20 percent of our our sales now are like coming like up like off of amazon totally also the amazon advertising in canada in particular is a lot less competitive than the united states so i would look i think the uk market's pretty good similar i'm not really hot on europe because the dollar's been pretty 
strong there and it's been making the margins pretty compressed and it's also harder to market like really well like in non-english markets but we're having products be more successful in the uk and in canada than they are like in the us and for web deals direct i have that a lot i have a product it was no longer a successful product in the us like in canada it made 500 dollars profit like a day those are like different areas we're doing and i've also become like a much more sophisticated ad manager than like i was before so before i was just like setting up ads i didn't really pay that much attention to match types i didn't really do anything with like negative keywords i didn't do anything with display ads going through like search reports figuring out like keywords shouldn't be big bidding on and like negating them out and like breaking down rate costs like doing stuff like that if that makes sense like i, I would just, i would just look at like campaign manager and say like this word has like a 48 cost i need to bid less i didn't look like okay this is a broad keyword see like what search terms are actually generated from that let's see if any of them convert crappy it's negative them out the ones that are bidding good let's turn them into like into like an exact campaign and then bid like the appropriate amount for it so like between like getting rid of junk results that are coming in from like our phrase and broad and like day parting and like not running ads like at certain times the other thing i started doing in like right next door, i noticed that during like a bunch of different holidays our ad perform like people were just looking and like we would get like a horrible a cost on like mother's day father's day fourth of july stuff like that so i just like started like put a 20 percent coupon on my products like those days across the entire store and turn all ads off and i ended up like doing great and i'd have like the best profit day like i had like an entire month because people actually buy because they see a coupon and then like the redemption rates yeah the redemption rates on the coupon are only like 50 percent. so if you have like a 20 percent coupon on after the coupon fee and everything it's probably going to cost you like 11 percent or 12 percent because 45 percent of people don't click like the coupon actually so i don't know yeah. those, those are those are kind of different strategies that we're doing. Is that helpful? The single holidays is something we haven't done. I think we're gonna we're gonna test that out. We'll have to, we're taking notes on that one. We we did the um, holiday this year. We did uh, I think it was like the twenty third through the third of January. We shut ads off because we had seen historically the last two or three years, ACOS was like fifty to seventy percent because of window shoppers, like you said. So I think a couple comments. One, I think like what you mentioned, Adam, is you're just kind of like honing your skills on ads, getting better and better at ads. I think that's just gonna be the name of the game as Amazon moves forward. I know on their books, they released their books last few quarters and their advertising revenue comparable to the rest of their net income is just skyrocketing over the last year or two years. I think they're realizing that it's an easy revenue stream for them just to dial up the ads, you know, and it used to be on page one, it was like three or six slots for ads. Now I think it's half the page is advertising. And so- Yeah, de definitely. Actually, we have a couple different ad reps. If you spend a pretty good amount that are from Amazon and I actually found on the Amazon ad reps to be more helpful for us than like the agencies that we like hired and tried and they can run ads for you or like set up campaigns and like you can approve them and we've gotten like a lot of value with them they're pretty good at I think people are generally weak with like display and branded so like we had them like set up all our display and branded and then like the ones that, that they did a really good job on we kept the ones that didn't perform we like turned off and we ended up like with a bunch of campaigns that had like an ACOS of like 15 that were spending like a couple thousand dollars a day in our store so i thought that was valuable so like i wouldn't i wouldn't refrain away from like if you get the opportunity to work with amazon and their ads specifically i know a lot of people delete those emails but we've had a good experience yeah i, I was just gonna say that i i need to stop deleting those emails and actually take a take a meeting with them and see because i think we get those every every month for for each brand and, and i've always just deleted them yeah the, the things that i would be like apprehensive to try is like anything that they give you if you really become a big center they'll try to do stuff like get get want you to advertise on like amazon live or like on their their fire pad things or whatever and if it's not like really measurable and you can show acos on it like i wouldn't do it like they're going to talk to a lot about building up your brand and stuff like that but most people just don't have enough margin to build up your brand i mean if, if you're shark vacuum and you're making 70 percent margin on your vacuum you can invest money building your brand if you're a bright tech vacuum which is my best category bright tech and you're making 37 percent margin on your vacuum you don't have a, you have to just have return on your ads you know what i mean there's a big huge leap to be to becoming a shark you know what i mean yeah other follow-up question i have for you is right in that same space so if you're running a large store do you manage and specifically ppc last question i have on ppc before we move on but if you're managing a large you know revenues upwards of 20 50 million do you have a strategy on uh, the amount you spend for ppc or do you unlock it if it's under a say a cost of 30 we spend as much as you can that keeps the a cost up because we've noticed in niches like like i could be i'm gonna go back to back 
vacuums. We have a vacuum that's like maybe like the 25th to 30th bestseller. Just to give you an idea of depth, that's like maybe 100 sales a day. It's a pretty competitive, huge net. So I noticed that like our sales up to a certain amount, like our organic grows a lot and like we're making like $65 on an organic sale. So we want organic sales. So if our sales volume of our daily sales drops from like 100 to like 60, our organic sales like fall off a cliff. So that's why like, that's like why you want to do it. It's not, it's not so you can get like all these sales. And then if you have a good product, you like want to get like as many reviews. As so you basically like want to run more ads, but you don't want to run them like unprofitably. I'm not a big proponent anymore of unprofitable ads. I don't even run a lot of unprofitable ads on new launches. Anymore. I generally for new launches will like do Vine. So we have some reviews. We'll be patient. So we have like our 25, 30 reviews and then we'll start running ads. And I try to get to like a cost of like 45 to 50 by like week two or three. I'm not really, I don't really see the benefit of like a short run blast it's it, if it doesn't sustainable it's not going to sustain your organic traffic and it's going to spend a lot of money so i just like you don't want to go into like advertising with like no reviews because then like one or two bad reviews can like ruin the whole rating and momentum on it but we'll go in with with like a completed vine campaign we'll just send the you know the units in wait for it to be over and then we'll start running from there if that makes okay. sense i used to like totally try to blast it but i've just noticed like the results are not sustainable that like you got in the blast like once you ease off so you didn't really get like a huge benefit from it and the margins are just so much thinner with the percentage of sales that are ads that i don't think you want to throw that much money away on ads yeah absolutely the the last question i had is so if i get this right at that volume then you're not managing for tacos you're saying hey any 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 ads i can buy at a 30 percent acos we're going to unlock budgets and that's going to push organic sales up which are way more profitable to balance that out we're looking at tacos as a as a tool but we're we're pushing out as much break-even advertisements like as we can like on every single product so in general based on our products in our store our a cost target is like 20 to 30 percent and that's basically like the average product has a 35 percent margin and a five percent return rate gross this stuff all makes sense to me but i don't see like a lot of people say that i'm just saying that's like the, that's like the rationale of why we're doing it we're not coming up with exciting profits. I don't want to, like, I came on here the like two years ago and I was like, we have like 35% margin and all this stuff. If like after storage costs and everything, you're at like in the teens for margin in this business, it's pretty good. I think in Canada, the UK, you could probably do better. But in the US, if you want to be competitive, that's where you want to be. And then like, we had some listings and my friend who I sit on the board, they had some listings that have like tens of thousands of reviews or a pretty good listing. And they ha and they were like number one at bestseller tags. If you didn't lower the prices on them, like in the last year, they like somebody else came in and like took over being number one because you can't sit there forever, no matter how great you think your listing is and have like an oversized 50, 60% margin and think it's going to last forever. I mean, yeah. Space Saver was the number one seller of Space Saver bags on Amazon for five, six, seven years in a row. And it's not anymore. It's because um, I was selling a Space Saver Bag Center, Best Asian, at twenty five ninety nine pre COVID. We went to thirty nine ninety nine during COVID, and I mean I don't know the store anymore. But the last time I looked, it was being sold at the similar price to what we were selling it at. So that's just not a competitive price. If we're making 50, 60 percent margin, somebody's going to come in and a Chinese seller and take twenty five percent margin, and they're going to take number one. So then you got to decide like you want to have less, you want to keep have a losing market share or not. In general, I think unfortunately that if you accept losing market share. Share, like eventually your listings are going to become less and less relevant. And that's basically Amazon and why it's become more of commoditization unless you have like a real super, like, you know, like a real super brand, like a shark vacuum or Eureka or whatever. Yeah. Which nobody, nobody that you're going to get on a call has a brand. I mean, we had some really good brands like a Zap It for Bug Zapper. That, that sounds like a real corporate brand and it, it would, it would, you know, because it was Zap It and it looked at some cool graphics, it would get a premium, but it's not, it's not Shark or Coca-Cola or whatever. Awesome. Well, this has been really, really good conversation. I think we could we could spend another couple hours just focused on PPC, but let's turn the corner and talk a little bit about product selection and identifying products. That's something that as people that have existing businesses, obviously that's the lifeblood of your company is introducing more products. And when you're just getting started, it can be overwhelming. And so curious if when you're looking for new products to sell, are there any price points or categories or sizes that you're focused on or use as criteria? We tried to do the strategy for Brightech actually. I just came off of this huge, you know, huge windfall sale 
of what deals correct. And I actually didn't even go to Broad Tech with my own money. We had a really good relationship with our bank. They loaned us millions of dollars to start like this new store, which they would never do like in the startup. So I was like, let's go sell more expensive, higher end items, oversized items, because they're going to be more, they're going to be like less competitive, higher margins and stuff like that. And I think that's really been a mixed bag. I'll just give you like examples of it. So I met a guy at Perch. He used to work on rugs.com. Rugs.com has a brand called New Loom on Amazon. They're like the 10,000 pound gorilla on the site. He was doing like work for them. They're making tens of millions of dollars on it. Like, let's go into Rug. There's this huge barrier to entry. It's massively expensive. We're importing a lot of product from Turkey and India, only a little bit from China. That's really complicated. Nobody really knows how to do that. This is going to be great. And then we're going to do it. We're going to sell it 3P instead of 1P. So we want to introduce Turkish rugs and we were really cautious. We made designs very similar to stuff that were popular. I didn't try to pick like reinvent the, you know, reinvent something. Juke rugs, which are like a thinner, like single color, like brownish rug. And then like a plush rugs, which came from China. And the Turkish rugs is the best quality product I've ever sold. It's like, should be so much more on Amazon, but they're just like people that are selling it through New Loom at like margins that are only like 30, 30, 35% and like really pushed down the market. But we've been getting killed at it because the reason why the big rug sellers are selling on 1P is because on Amazon, the FCs have been like rejecting our inventory, like left and right. You would just like randomly send in a truck of rugs that weigh like 50 pounds each. And they just like, don't feel like accepting the rugs. And then like you have, you have your delivery canceled, you had all these fees associated with it and then have to redo it. And the math of like the entire business work, everything. And the fact we had 50% of our rug shipments into Amazon rejected, like made the whole thing like a colossal failure for Turkish rugs. Now Jew rugs happen to weigh a lot less and, and the plush rugs than the Turkish rugs. So we're able to make those work, but we're basically selling off like a million and a, and a million and a half dollars of the other product. And then like other ideas that we tried, just to give you an idea, vacuums, stick vacuums, end up being really successful for us. I'm just going to make like over a million dollars profit this year. And we tried canopies, like pop-up canopies. And I think that would have worked. And we spent a lot of time sourcing it and our product hovered around a 4.2. And if your product wasn't 4.3 on Amazon, 4.5 visible, like you couldn't charge any, any margin on it at all, like, because no one would buy it. So it's basically like you could get like 35, 40% margin if you're at 4.5 visible and a good looking listing. And if it was a 4.2 listing, you're just basically like skimping by with like almost no margin. So that was, that was a failure for us. Like, I think like in general, we've been more successful on selling stuff that costs less money, more like five to $15 for a unit. And I mean, our success rate has never been like super duper awesome. Great. I would say like, if we launched three things that like one thing would be a loser, one thing would be like minorly successful. Like maybe we can make it make $200 profit a day after for like a year and the other thing would go like colossally great like it makes a thousand dollars or more a day profit and then like we noticed things that we made a thousand dollars or more a day profit on that if you did related things in that niche variations different sizes similar product that the chances of that being successful is way higher and clear space is an example of that our store that did 25 million last year we launched a couple different plastic containers and they did well so then we launched different sizes two pack four pack six packs eight pack one to the top blah 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 and you know we went from selling you know, $10,000 a day, like a year and a half ago. In January, we did $150,000 a day, like on Amazon. And it's just like, it's just like doubling, tripling, quadrupling down, like, on what work. But in general, like what we try to do is we try to pick niches with depth. So like in the example of like the vacuum niche, you could be like the hundredth best seller on vacuums and stick vacuum category and still sell like 50 a day. And the gross margin on a vacuum is like 50, 60, $70. So you can see like, if you can get anywhere in the top 100 in that category, you're going to make some money. And then if you're fortunate enough that you could get in the top 10, you're going to have like a multi-million dollar product. It's more competitive, but there's a lot, there's a lot of winners in it. Like mostly like if you look at kitchen storage, which is like clear space, very similar, like a top 100 seller still selling like 50 units. Number one seller selling like number two, three unit. I think we have really the new number two best seller in the category, selling like five, 600 units with that skew. Like a day, generally the type of stuff. So like people usually shy away from niches like that we've got after like vacuums, kitchen storage, 
space saver bags, you know, hoses, roll covers. They're like really competitive, huge niches. But then like some of them we ended up in the middle or even like you do really mediocre and end up like 80th best seller and you have a product that's making, you know, like 200 bucks a day. But then you get some that's like 20, 30th best seller. You have a product that's making several hundred thousand dollars. And then like once in a while, you have your product, like maybe like one every three to six categories you join where it becomes like, well, I consider a big winner now with today's margin if it makes over a thousand dollars more. Profit. And then like um, you, you have your profitable items and you're doubling and tripling down. And then you're also at least putting them in like the UK and Canada markets because those are easy to implement because they're English based and they have a lot less barriers than like the European market. And like I personally have never tried tried like Japan or India or anything like that, but I don't know anyone who's an American seller who's ever made good money in any of those markets. So I'm really reluctant to try. I'm basically sticking with those three. When I had Web Deals Direct, we tried to, you know, go outside of Amazon try Walmart, eBay, Shopify, retail. And we brought in a lot of staff and made our business a lot more complicated to do all those things. And at the end of the day, when you looked at our $18 million of EBITDA when we sold, $17.5 million of dollars came from Amazon and $500,000 of EBITDA came from this other stuff. So when we started the like the new businesses, we decided just, just to stick to like the bread and butter and like keep it simple, stupid. So like we have like the easiest, smallest headcount business that you ever seen. So we basically have three guys, me, Duncan, Charles. We have two stores, Clearspace, Brightech. We have one VA that supports like both stores for customer service and admin tasks. And then everything else is like outsourced. And we use like Flex or AGL and stuff like that. And we're talking about just to give you volume between both stores this year, we'll probably do like 45, 50 million in sales with basically th like basically like three staff. And that's <laughs> I... that's because that's because we're not trying we're not trying to do too many things. We're just trying to keep it really simple. We, we're not doing it. We're not on eBay. We're not on Walmart. We're not on Shopify. We're not doing retail. Um, when we have to do something that's related to graphics or design or photography, we're just outsourcing it. Or we have uh, like there's really good three PLs out there that that worked before. The problem with them is there's such a demand for them that they don't even want the small fish anymore. So like you talk to a company like Flex, they'll say like unless your bill to us is a hundred thousand dollars a month, we're, they, at some point like we were told they wouldn't even take you as a customer. And that was like wow. recent. So it's just like if you want to have like a like a full service like really good three PL. Like the whole entire marketplace is just not geared for like the guy who's your neighbor who wants to keep his job and have a side gig and put 25,000 bucks down and turn it into like a $50,000 income. Like the way it was like in 2015, 16, 17, 18, maybe 19 with the last year. It's really, it's a much more professional cost, you know, costly endeavor to like get onto Amazon. People come up to me and say, want to get onto Amazon. I'm like, you need hundreds of thousands of dollars or or you need access to like hundreds of thousands of dollars of credit or like an or and if you don't have that um your chances of succeeding are very 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 low and yeah like but before that i i used to I had a whole bunch of friends in like 16 and 17 they got into amazon and like i was so confident that they were going to succeed on amazon with me helping them a little bit i actually like posted on facebook i think it's 2017 anyone who wants to get into facebook i will teach you how to sell on amazon and then i had like one or two people go badly out of like maybe like 10 and like i basically like helped them out financially because I didn't want like them to take a loss. But like, I would never ever like go on to like Facebook right now and say like, and say like, um, I'm going to go help you sell on Amazon. It's just not the same. It's it's, it's, it's very, very difficult now. It's, for, it's yeah. for them. The landscape has definitely changed over the last several years. Um, Just to kind of round out the uh, product selection phase. So Adam, it sounds like you've kind of cleaned it up from your web deals direct to now you've got two new brands. And so, you, so you're launching, you're trying like oversize, you know, trying a bunch of different things, launching like say three products at a time, one crushes it one does medium and one is a dud so are you phasing out those duds and then the other ones that are not doing okay and just keeping the really good ones and then launching three more or are you building a brand around the one that does well or how, how do you no i know i mean like the, the ones that are doing well you're trying to build a brand around especially if they're if there's like related stuff unless there unless there's a special reason why that one is doing well that's like not repeatable i'll give you an example of that we have one stick vacuum that was doing really well so we decided to launch two more and we were getting a good percentage of our sales from some affiliates 
sites and some of them being review sites. And we found out that like one vacuum on like the review sites would just like overshadow the other one. So like you couldn't like make all three of them succeed. So if it wasn't, if you were, if it wasn't successful on Amazon without like the off Amazon traffic, like I wouldn't do it. But in general, like in a space like ClearSpace where we're having containers that work and we're making different ki- different size containers and ones with dividers and ones with tops and stuff like that, yeah, doubling, tripling down makes sense. Or even with your existing listings, like adding onto it, we still had Jute Rug. And we started, and then like the main color of jute rugs is brown. And then we picked like all the popular sizes to start off with, maybe like eight or 10 sizes. So that started to do well. So then we added runners and then runners made an extra $500, like the ones you put in your hallway and stuff like that. Sure. Well, like when we first launched, we didn't launch black ones and white ones because like, so now we're adding black ones and we're adding white ones. And like every time we incrementally like add something like that for a listing that's like already has organic ranks, 4.4 rating, 700 reviews or whatever. Now, like it's like easier to get traffic and sales to it. We're incrementally adding something to it, which we see other more mature listings like already have. And then like we have like four or five hundred dollars of revenue from adding runners and that i mean a, a profit and then we're adding i'm we're about to add black i think black will make like three four hundred dollars and we'll, we'll have like two things well very targeted ad campaigns like we're only targeting we already have ones that are really optimized for like jube rug jube rug five by seven jube rug seven by nine so we're just gonna have campaigns that are like black jube rug jube rug black crap like that and then we'll get some people that are looking for regular jute rugs will just like black and then the other ads that will come in will be like really targeted so the ACOS should be good I'm also benefiting from the fact that my listing where I added this ver- variation already has a four or five visible and already has like 700 reviews does that make sense oh yeah absolutely so, so, so you really want to bid on your winner so then you have a winner then go check does this type of niche do well in Canada and you know all the data is there from Jungle Scout and all that kind of stuff and th- that's what you should do next if that makes sense or the UK but we spent a lot of time in Europe and Web Deals Direct. And I went and looked at my margin in Europe. And like the year we sold the business, we did like in Europe, like six million in sales. And our margins were like five percent. So that's why I've that's why I've avoided Europe. But I I I treat Europe and UK differently, especially since Brexit, because you have to like import them separately and they have a whole different set of rules. Yeah, for sure. So we're we're coming up on time, but David, we probably have time for another two questions. I know you had a couple on your mind for Adam. Let's see. Inventory storage and these new capacity limits. So how are you handling these? And just to our listeners, Amazon has thrown us a series of curveballs as it relates to inventory capacity and storage limits. And as we record this, yesterday was March 1st, there was another big change. And so how have you been navigating this? Okay. Um, This has been particularly frustrating and um, it's been extremely frustrating, like opening new stores because like Web Deals Direct, when we first started selling Web Deals Direct, like storage space was not an issue. You go look, you have a new account, it would say like like 1 million units you could have. So one of the things we did was like ClearSpace existed before Bride Tech. So we took a bunch of ClearSpace products and I had some friends who had sold oversized stuff and I got the, and I bought their inventory and I went and sold it in my other store for like two months before I started selling in Bride Tech. So then it like moved up my inventory based on their stuff that like already moved really, really well. And that like enabled me to like go into the like Bride Tech instead of up a thousand units like the first day my first shipment went in, I had like 30,000. I thought that was particularly smart. I think that you had to do stuff like that. The real challenges we had is we decided to sell some items that were Christmas branded. So they moved like awesome, but they only moved awesome like for, for Christmas. So it was challenging because we wanted to send in like 40, 50,000 units and they had like no history of them. I don't know. We sent them all in and then we got into a situation where then Amazon lowers your storage like in like once it gets into the holiday season and then we couldn't send in our other stuff. It's really, and then the storage fees in the fourth quarter are really expensive. So it's it's very, very challenging what to figure out what to do, especially if you're trying to grow, like in that example or a new category. A lot of it's like luck because you can't even time it the way you want. Like there's a lot of like, you want to send stuff in during holiday season and like it takes weeks and weeks to get in or it could just like go in nice and smooth. And like when you're planning it out, like you just never know. So like your example, like where you have your own warehouse where you have like a backup option, like FBM and stuff like that. We're doing like that type of stuff. Like if this doesn't go in, like FBM is, not as good as FBA, but it's better than like not selling the item at all. So like we'll prepare for things like that. It's pretty hard, but I think the new changes that Amazon made are better that went in March 1st, but I can't tell yet because it's been like one day, but our store and both of our stores, the amount of available units went up by 40, like 40% versus like February 28th. But I like the idea that they can allow you to pay more to send in something to bid against somebody else. Because if I want to make a decision that I really need to get these like toys in for Christmas, because like people are only going to buy toys like in December, I would rather like 
accept a lesser margin to be able to get them in than, than have to go do them FBM or, or get someone to do FBM on it when everyone's doing FBM because it's Christmas. So I think it like gives you like more options than like what you have before. But yeah, we're in general, we're having way more problems with, with Amazon FCs, stuff that like I would never have thought of like a couple of years ago, just like your stuff getting rejected. We were sending in, this is new to me from last week. We we're sending in our best ASIN from Crunchbase. We had like a full container of it because we're selling like 600 units a day and they literally accepted like half the container and they said, you don't need any more of it. And then they just said, um, and then they just rejected like six or 7,000 units in the container and then sent it back and we had to make another appointment. So I don't even know what's going to happen, but I opened up a case where like we want to be reimbursed because like they didn't send the units in. It's particularly hard. And then like, I, we don't definitely don't do everything right. Biggest mistake we did, like, especially when you're selling something for like the first year, you don't know how it's going to do. You're going to make some dumb decision. Clear space, I mean, we sold in 2021, but only like $10,000 a day. And then it went like tenfold. We didn't realize that like fourth quarter plastic storage containers don't do that well because people like to spend their money on gifts and that's not really a gift item. Then it explodes again in January. So we just had way too much stuff at Amazon. It's extremely big and bulky. People and our sales dropped from the third quarter and the fourth quarter by like 30%. And as a result, we incurred storage fees for the fourth quarter at an average of $350,000 a month. And it wiped out like almost all of our entire profits for the for the fourth quarter. We made like, we were going to make like 400,000 a month profit and instead we made like zero because of that. Now we're going to know for like next year that like people don't buy as many storage containers in November and December as they do like in October for some reason. So don't have that many there. It was a big, ugly, painful million dollar lesson. So I mean, that's that's part of it. I mean, like I was selling Space Saver bags and there's a lot of seasonality to that too and I never would have thought it. And I made a lot of mistakes, but never any of that that bad because of it. Just the clear space ended up being really bad because like plastic bags were like flat and small. And the biggest storage bill I ever had for Webbills Direct was like 130000 for a month, like in the fourth quarter. I never even heard of a $350,000 storage bill. I've never met anybody who's had a storage bill like that. But yeah, let, there's a lot of um, unfortunate lessons that you have to learn being an entrepreneur and going into a niche and try to grow and be successful. And you have to use your best judgment and sometimes you're wrong. We had a similar situation, much smaller, but a similar situation last year in one of our brands for the wintertime storage fee, and that was not fun. We're coming up on time. I definitely, like, I think we could probably talk for another hour, but, uh, and, and maybe, Adam, maybe we bring you on back next year and kind of see see what's, what's going on there. But I definitely want to get into the fire round. It'll be an abbreviated round because this is your second time. Are you ready? I'm ready, but don't ask me about books this time. <laughs> All right. What are your hobbies? What are my hobbies? I love tennis and I love boating and I'm starting to like golf a lot. And I didn't want to retire, but I wanted to kind of expand those hobbies. So typically I usually work until about now, like about two o'clock in the afternoon. And then I take like the second half of the afternoon off and I do one of those type of activities like pretty much like every day. And that's something I wasn't really able to do with Web Deals Direct. My wife's a doctor. She doesn't want to quit being a doctor for another 10 years. So like people are like, why do you do nothing? I'm like, go do nothing by yourself like all day. Pretty boring. You end up talking to yourself like in a restaurant. <laughs> talk to your phone but yeah I, I um i started playing a bunch of different tennis leagues and i really like that a lot i'm not a great athlete but i'm good enough that i can give some middle-aged men some competition and yeah that's like the stuff that i like to do and um if i wasn't an entrepreneur i wouldn't be able to like go play tennis at two o'clock in the afternoon or go on my boat or something like that and that's one of the things i'm super thankful about what is one thing that you do not miss about working for the man i really like to be able to like make my own decisions about like what i'm doing and not to have to be an organization where you like have to go get everything approved and that's probably like the biggest thing is you're just able to it's great but then if you're not if you're not an entrepreneur it's like paralyzing for people they don't want to like make their own decisions and have to live with it for the business but i felt a lot of times like when i was working in consulting that i could be a partner but i wasn't allowed to be a partner and they didn't give me a chance and like i mean i only made it like to middle management and i was working that base for 14 years and i just felt like i was pigeonholed by it i could go be like a great salesman and bring on like these huge contracts for like my company but I, they just i I, like it was in a system where I wouldn't be given the chance and to grow and achieve kind of where I was at. And like, if you're an entrepreneur, even someone like me, who's a guy trying to mostly be at home, raising their kids can grow a business that makes $18 million profit in a year. You can really, you can really grow things beyond your wildest dreams. I mean, I, I never even intended to do that. 
You know, my dream was to make three hundred fifty thousand bucks a year selling on Amazon. Yeah, we started. Nah, it's yeah, it's uh, it's a remarkable story. It's very inspiring. David, over to you to close out the show. Yeah, what, Adam, I want to thank you for being a guest on the Firing the Man podcast, and and I do feel like we just scratched the surface on some of these topics. So definitely going to have to have you back on. But thank you so much for your time. Yeah, anytime. If you want to bring me back next year, I'll be glad to show up. We we'd love to have you. All right. Thank you, Adam. Real quick before you go, thanks for watching the video. And if you found value in this video in any way, please hit that like button and the subscribe button and uh, stay tuned for new videos. If you have ideas or suggestions for future videos, put them in the comments below. David and I will pop in there and, and uh, we'll make some more content. Uh, appreciate it.